Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This is our seventh workshop of the year, and we want to thank you all for joining us and let you know that we greatly appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us. I'm Tom Concolino, and I'm here with our presenters, Angela Criswell and Aya Takaze. Thank you all for attending our Gaku's virtual workshop series on X-ray computed tomography. This is the second part of our session on CT data analysis using Dragonfly. And as with our previous sessions, this will be taking place in the lab with Angela and I are reviewing in real time how to analyze CT data for a variety of sample types. Please note, if you missed any of the previous workshops, you can view them on the Ragaku website. We also want to welcome Dr. Mike Marsh, the Dragonfly product manager from Object Research Systems as a guest panelist. He'll be able to add additional thoughts and answer questions throughout the session as well. But before we start, a few housekeeping items. As far as today goes, this is going to be an interactive session and we'll be taking your questions live during the webcast. So please don't wait until the end to ask. And as usual, please submit those questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Now we won't be monitoring the raised hand function and I'll be posting relevant links in the chat window. Uh, we'll be trying to answer as many questions as we can during the workshop and we'll respond to any unanswered questions after the session is complete. If for whatever reason you have difficulty viewing the workshop live, please note it is being recorded and you will be able to view the recording beginning tomorrow. And with that said, I'll turn it over to Angela and Aya. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Aya. Thanks very much, Mike, for joining us here today. And most importantly, thank all of you who are in attendance. Like uh, Tom mentioned, we are presenting live from our office here in the Woodlands, where we're going to give uh, another live demonstration of the micro CT data analysis package called Dragonfly. And the uh, topics for this particular workshop are those that were selected by audience members at our first Dragonfly workshop. And so Tom can put a link to that workshop in the chat uh, window in case you missed it. You might wanna go back and, and have a look at it. Okay, but more specifically, what we're gonna do is we're gonna cover how to do deep learning segmentation. We're also going to look at how to separate objects and then we're gonna look at how to apply quantitative analyses to those separated objects. And as we mentioned, we're gonna use the Dragonfly software. Specifically, we're using Dragonfly 2021.1. Uh, if you use Dragonfly, you're probably aware that a new version 2021.3 is about to be released imminently. And uh, if you're, interested, please visit the Dragonfly website. And I believe there's a recording there that shows you some of the new features that will be coming up and perhaps we'll mention them today as well. Okay, with that said, it's time to get started here. And to do that, I'm gonna share a different screen. All right, so uh, this is the Dragonfly interface. Um, and what we're gonna start with is a data set on denim. And I'm just gonna import that data set, it's here. Uh, and we're gonna start separating this using deep learning. But before we start, I is gonna ask you our first poll question um, about how we're gonna do this. So the first question is about threshold. So what thresholding algorithm is best described as one that returns a single intensity threshold that separate pixels into two separate classes? Maybe like a background and object. So which algorithm is the answer? So the choices are machine learning, O2 method, histogram shape-based method and image segmentation. You see that the questions are becoming harder <laughs> as we go through the season. Okay, a lot of people are voting. I'm gonna give you a few more seconds. It's actually more split than I thought it would be. Mm -hmm. Okay, so most of you voted, so I'm gonna end the polling and share the results. Okay, so it's close, but 
image segmentation was the winner. Okay, so image segmentation is actually what we want to do. And the method that we're gonna use is Otsu's method. So that's the, the correct answer in this case. So I is gonna stop sharing those results. Uh, I'm gonna go back to our screen here and we're gonna find out how we do segmentation starting with Otsu's method. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take advantage of Dragonfly's segmentation wizard. It's extremely powerful to get you started. And we just need to pick a general area here where we're gonna start painting. So I'm just gonna add this area. Now, the thing you'll notice about this particular data set are that there are some large fibers. Uh, of course, there's background or air, the dark portion, and then there are some smaller fibers. And what we want to do ultimately is to separate large fibers, small fibers, and air. So I'm gonna add just a region and we're gonna start by painting that. So we need our background. How about air? We'll make it dark. So makes things easier to see. Uh, we'll make these our large fibers. And let's add a class. And these will be our small fibers. And we're going to use the Otsu method that I talked about. So first, we're going to define a range. And we're going to use an upper Otsu to pick a threshold level where there we have foreground and background. And then we can start to assign some of these uh, highlighted areas to different types of fibers. So we're going to first paint some large fibers. And I can make this quite big. We don't have to paint every single one of them. We can paint some small fibers. We have some here. We have some there. We can also invert this. And now we can have uh, the air background selected. You just paint a little bit of that as well. So once we've done that, then we're ready to start training. So we'll click train and then away we go. So this particular quick start uh, model generation strategy uses a couple of machine learning techniques as well as a deep learning technique. So we're just gonna let it do this. Um, and it starts out with the machine learning. Now, one of the things that uh, we need to do is to get our input model. So that'll go into our next polling question that I is going to ask you right now. Okay. So let me open the next one. So the next question is about deep learning. What is an important requirement for performing deep learning segmentation? So here are the choices a data set that is free of noise or sparse training data or ground truth input data or a histogram with the well-defined peaks and valleys. So which one, you know, many things matter, but which one is the most important one for deep learning segmentation? Okay, we are about halfway through voting. Gonna give you a few more seconds. Okay, I think most of you voted. So let me end the polling and share the results. Okay, so ground truth input data had the highest voting. Okay, rate. so it looks like some of you have done deep learning before because that is the correct answer. So in order to have a successful deep learning run, we have to provide it with some ground truth input data that's accurately depicts our different classes. So, uh, so Aya has hidden those results and then we're ready to go. So it's run through each of the methods, the two machine learning techniques, as well as the deep learning. And it's gonna give us some results or predictions based on the learning that it's done so far. And if we have a look, we see that in fact, the machine learning runs have done much better. So for example, it does a better job at identifying large and small fibers in air than the deep learning run that ran for a short period of time. And that's because our input data was quite sparse. Um, but we're gonna fix that right now. So I'm just gonna promote one of these uh, machine learning runs. I am gonna 
go somewhere else in the data set, for example, and I'm going to pick a different area. Actually, I know there's some interesting looking fibers near the, the end of the data set. And it's nice to be able, to, it's nice to include uh, areas of the data set where things might look a bit different than in other places. And in this case, here we have some small fibers that are extended, they're just a different orientation. So I'm gonna pick this area and I'm gonna predict what each of the classes should be based on the machine learning and deep learning runs. Okay, so you'll see here that as in the case before machine learning did better, I'm gonna promote one of these. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna prepare that ground truth data. So I'm gonna select the two fibers. And now what I can do is I can paint one or the other one based on whether I pick control to paint the large fibers. Hand is shaky today. Too much coffee, I guess. Or the small fibers here. And now, as I paint these, you're probably thinking, well, I'm kind of messy. I'm not doing too great of a job. And that's, that's true. Um, if you're doing this at home, then you won't have the constraints of uh, a workshop running. And so you would take your time to, uh, to do this a bit better. I can go back to here. And we need to, uh, again, correct some of these. One of the other things you might notice is over here in the background, you'll see uh, some small fibers that are labeled small fibers. However, it's like more likely that these are background. So you might want to clean that up a little bit as well. I'm not gonna take the time to do that within the constraints of this workshop today, but uh, certainly the more correct your information is, then the better your training results are going to be. Okay. And then lastly, because we really are only interested in uh, looking at deep learning, I'm going to turn off uh, the machine learning at this point and tell it to train. So what you're going to see when this starts is this window, and it shows a graph of each of the runs or epochs and their corresponding uh, scores. And these are lost scores. So they range from zero to one, and the lower the score, the better. So you should see this value drop over time um, as the deep learning improves. Uh, one of the things that uh, I'll just mention, uh, Mike showed in his webinar last week of a new feature where you get a live display. Do you wanna mention something about that, Mike? What, what you see on the right side of this graph in 2021.3? Uh, sure, thanks, Angela. Yeah, so the, the update is, uh, is compared to the current version that we see now, where you will see the loss function and how it changes from one epoch to the next. In the update, you get that same loss function, but also on the screen, you'll see uh, any arbitrary frame of the data and see how well the model does at segmenting it. And you'll see how that updates from one epoch to the next. So you'll say, oh, wow, it's, it's learning, it's getting better, but it's not there yet. It's very nice to have a visual of how the prediction and labeling looks in addition to just seeing a raw score. Definitely, that live uh, depiction of, of the painted pixels based on the current run is pretty powerful. So I can't wait for that in the next version. So you'll see here that in this plot, we have some points that are depicted by small triangles and other points depicted by uh, circles. So the triangles are the saved, the last saved model. And so this one is not saved, of course, because it didn't really improve over the last saved model. So we'll give it a chance to run for just a tad bit longer, and then we'll have a look at uh, these results. One other thing that Mike showed in the webinar last week is that in the new version, you can also choose to save more than one model. So you, you won't just have the, the last best uh, scored model. All right, so let's stop this and just have a look at how it did. Well,
usually it just predicts right away. I think maybe if you stop it early, uh, it, It'll, it, won't do it, it waits and says, you stopped early, let me wait to see what you want to do. If you let it uh, run a full run, then it goes ahead and makes that prediction. Gotcha. Makes complete sense. Okay, so uh, here, now we see the uh, deep learning run, and it's actually doing much better in this case compared to uh, what it did before. And if we go to our input frame here, uh, and we ask it to look at this, then again, it's doing a fairly good job, much better than it did before. And it turns out if we continue to train, which I'm gonna let it do, uh, then it's gonna do even better. So what you'll notice here is in the Epoch's progress bar on the right, it says we're currently on some number of a total of 100. So normally you would let this run for 100 Epochs, but again, because we're in a workshop mode, we don't perhaps have all the time to do, to do that. But um, what happens when you restart training is that it doesn't start from the beginning, it starts from the last train model. So all of these times we click train and let it run, they're cumulative, uh, which makes it easy for you to see how things are going. So we'll just let it run for a couple more and we'll check and see how, how it did. But uh, basically it illustrates now that our scores are lower than the last of the last run. You want to take a question real quick? Yeah, we had a sure. Of them come in here. So, all right. Um, so uh, Chandra is asking. Uh, she says it appears that you only bring it. You can only bring in a grayscale image into the segmentation wizard. So, if another lookup table better separates your classes, is it possible to use something other than grayscale for the deep learning training? And I don't know if that's a mic question or. A... Yeah, I, I've never <laughs> used anything other than grayscale. <laughs> How about sure. that? So, but that's a good question. Uh, I thought that we should we could address that while can, we're learning. Can I have two minutes or should I save my answer for later? Go you want to let it be? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Mike. I, I didn't, know, didn't know if I had time. Yeah. So um, when you have a single grayscale image, like something from an x-ray experiment, you only have one channel of information. And how you color it on screen, whether you color it from black to white in shades of gray, or whether you use an arbitrary lookup table to uh, use pseudo color, it doesn't change the intensity or the signal that's there. And so it won't learn any better if you happen to use a lookup table. That's true for any single channel data set like a grayscale x-ray image or an electron micrograph. If you have multiple signals in your data, for example, if you collected something on a bright field microscope where you have a color image, that's really three different signals, a red signal, a green signal, and a blue signal. In that case, you can actually tell Dragonfly when you launch the segmentation wizard, I wanna use all three. And you still only have to paint once, but when it evaluates and trains the coefficients, it's actually training independent coefficients to learn oh, you know what, the blue signal is very predictive of this phase, and maybe the, the green to red ratio is very predictive of this phase. So it has all of those signals to work with in learning the proper mathematical model to optimize segmentation. So if you have true multi-channel data, like a color image or multiple channels from an electron microscope, then you can leverage that. But if you just have a simple x-ray or electric single channel micrograph, it doesn't matter if it appears on screen as gray or with a lookup table, uh, it, it's all the same. All right, thanks, Mike. We deal with x-rays here, so all of ours are grayscale images. So, all right, we're gonna let it finish this last epoch and we're gonna see how it did. Okay, so I'm gonna stop this. And again, we'll just uh, predict here. You'll see it's still predicting for the two uh, machine learning runs uh, because they are checked. Um, however, it's just based on that first run we did. So they, they of course haven't improved like the deep learning has. All right, so this is the prediction and it looks really good um, here. We can have a look at it from this one. It still needs some improvement. Uh, but certainly if we let it run the full eight, uh, full 100, we would get a much better result. Also, remember that that ground truth input data, the most more correct it is, the, the better your result is going to be. So you might want to pay attention to some of those noisy air pixels. Just 
before I close, I want, I, I, it's kind of like a cooking class in the sense that I've already let this run for a hundred epochs using almost the same two patches uh, that you see here. So I'm just gonna give you an example of what it would look like if we would have let this run for a hundred epochs. So this is our UNET denim model and we can segment all of these slices. It's gonna take a few seconds here in case we have time for a quick question we can do that we do have a we do have another question this is a uh, you know more philosophical is how how much deep learning do you need to understand to use it versus just hitting the button and letting dragonfly do its thing right well that's a that's a really good question and i can tell you that i was able to get going with dragonfly really easily without having a large uh, knowledge base of deep learning. So in the sense that Dragonfly prepares some potential models for you to use and has some reasonable initial settings. Uh, if you're gonna do this long-term, however, this you should probably uh, widen your knowledge base of that. And there are some great tools to do that. First of all, you can look at Dragonfly webinars. Um, and another thing that uh, I recommended to me when I first got started in X-ray imaging is uh, this YouTube channel, Three Blue, One Brown. So there is a neural networks uh, playlist that's really intuitive and it describes deep learning quite well. You might check that out. Um, but in a sense, you don't have to know what's going on in all these hidden layers of deep learning. Uh, you, any other comments from anybody else? Mike, Mike, or Mike has a comment. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Ooh, 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 just just, did, just <laughs> didn't want to interrupt. Yeah, um, no worries. Know, I would say I would say it's kind of like if you've ever used Excel and you you plotted some scatter data and you wanted to know is there a trend line for my data and you did a linear fit and you asked the question uh, how safe is it to use that without knowing how to compute it yourself or without knowing the algorithm. Um, I would say, you know, it depends on your responsibilities, but um, when those tools are there and mature, you can, you can trust them and use them without having to master them or know the algorithms behind them. And, uh, and I, I don't think I could do the linear fit, uh, but I would, I would trust it and use it. And uh, in fact, you can actually think of deep learning as doing a fitting routine, except it's just fitting 20 million parameters instead of two. So, uh, but it, as Angela says, if you watch that three brown, one blue uh, channel from, um, oh, I can't remember his name right now. Uh, it's a really terrific way and very intuitive way of starting to understand how these mathematical models get fit. And both for Grant, succeed. I think, from Stanford. Grant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Everybody it, really watches good. his videos in this industry. Right. Yeah, I think. It's terrific. <laughs> He, he does. He gives terrific descriptions, and not just on neural networks, but mm -hmm. uh, linear That's algebra or lots of other good topics. Okay, For so sure. this is the result of our deep learning run. You see, it did a pretty good job. It even found these small fibers in the upper left-hand corner. Um, but again, with only two small patches, it still has some improvements that could be made. So one of the things you might do is to provide it a full image, uh, or two, or three, or four for input uh, learning data. Okay, but basically uh, we, we kind of get the idea here of what you can do using deep learning for segmenting uh, large data sets, starting with a small bit of information. So the next thing uh, what I wanted to show you is using deep learning in a different way. So we're gonna go to new session. I'm not gonna save this uh, and I'm gonna import a data set called sand. So this is an x-ray data set of a tube filled with sand grains. And uh, we have a look at it and it's actually quite noisy. And so keeping in mind that our end goal of all of these uh, types of data analyses is we wanna segment it, then uh, what, what else can we do with deep learning? Well, we could certainly do what we just did and uh, use the segmentation wizard and, and do that sort of thing. But what I wanna show you is a different example of how we might use deep learning to denoise data. And so we're quickly gonna do that. So we're gonna go back to deep learning, but we're gonna go into uh, the module a different way. I'm gonna say new, uh, again, it's a UNet architecture, but instead of the model, I'm gonna pick regression and say generate. Say, okay, we're gonna close this and we're gonna go to training. So in this case, what, a, where, what is my training data? Well, I'm simply gonna duplicate our SAN data set 
and uh, my input will be the noisy sand data and my output is the same noisy sand data. And uh, this might seem extremely counterintuitive. You might be wondering, what are you doing? So, well, deep learning is uh, intelligent in the sense that it can denoise these data. So there is an algorithm or method called noise to noise, where uh, deep uh, neural networks look at um, the, the random noise throughout a data set and try to learn. This only works uh, under the assumption that most of the uh, voxel data are correct. So most of them are depicting the correct information in here. Um, and it's amazing it works. So uh, guys at NVIDIA, I think in MIT and, uh, and a university came up with this and they published a paper. Um, Tom can put a link to that paper as well as a talk uh, by the primary author of that paper where they describe how they use this for uh, image analysis. So what we wanna do here is we wanna get this uh, data to the point that it has fewer noise and I'll show you why in just a second. So Angela, we did have a question come in while this is chugging along. It's, um, it's how fast can the sharpness be improved or how can the sharpness be improved on those previous uh, samples? Previous right, so what you can do certainly to improve the quality of the data is just measure for longer. Uh, and it, it turns out that um, prior to these regression models, one of the things that you could do is you could put in a longer data set, a clean data um, at, to help learn where your noise was for your noisy data. Um, so that, that's something you can do. Uh, you can also use some image processing routines to sharpen the data um, for, for sure. I'm gonna stop this now what, rather than letting it go on. It's just a single epoch. Uh, and we're gonna have a look and we're going, I'm just gonna go ahead and let that run over all the slices. Okay, the, any other comments on, I mean, basically measuring data longer will help you. It also could be a factor of the resolution uh, that you collected your data at. So for perhaps you might explore using a different resolution for your sample, changing the field of view, the, those types of things to smaller, smaller value. All right. Um, and I think we're done here. I'm we're done, all right. Close this. I'm just going to discard it. So remember what I said in the beginning, the ultimate goal is to segment these data sets. And we could certainly use upper Otsu and we see, oh, wow, if I do this, there's no single value that really cleanly separates the two of these. We could instead use the deep learning algorithms we used, or we could try this denoising routine. And if we do that and click upper Otsu, we see that we can very cleanly now segment these data from letting it run for just uh, one epoch and it was quite easy to do. So it's just another example of the, the deep learning tool in Dragonfly that I would encourage you to check out. Okay, uh, now we're gonna go on to our next example. And we're gonna look at a very familiar data set. Yes, I wanna continue. So the reason I say it might look familiar is because uh, if you've been to any of our previous workshops uh, or webinars, you probably have seen these data. So this is a foam data set, and I believe it's earplugs. It's something that I had collected. And in our uh, last workshop uh, on image J, she showed you how to segment these data using machine learning. Um, and I, I think you used Dragonfly as well. I can't recall if you used it in that one. I think but I probably used it for Dragonfly too. I used this data for many different things. <laughs> right. So today we're not going to go revisit segmentation because you can certainly learn how to segment those data if you follow the link that Tom gave you earlier for the first Dragonfly workshop or if you watch our Image J workshop. But instead for this particular example, what I want to do is to show you how you might separate objects. So rather than having two distinctive regions of interest of foam 
and air, what if we want to analyze the distributions of these air pockets? I'm going to show you how to do that. And that leads us into our next polling question that I is going to ask you. Okay, so this is the third question of the day. So what method is commonly used for object separation, meaning that separating those old blue air pockets? So those are the choices. Thresholding, watershed transformation, entropy-based binarization, and object recognition. Which one is going to help you separate those objects? We're about halfway in, almost 70%. I'm going to give you a few more seconds to think. Pretty much a two-horse race here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> OK. So I'm going to end the polling and share the results. So it's close, but it looks like a thresholding one. OK, so it turns out that thresholding and entropy-based binarization are two techniques to segment data. So basically to create or assign voxels to your phone class or air class. They're not actually used to uh, do object separation. Instead, the watershed transformation is used to separate data. OK, so I is going to stop sharing these results with you, and we're going to look at how exactly are we going to do this. Um, and before we do that, she's going to ask you one more question. We're just going to quiz you to no end today. But <laughs> well, this is the last one, right? It is the last one. Yes. OK, so the last question is about the watershed on um, Angela just explained. So what is not required for watershed transformation? So here are the choices, a segmented data set, a multi-ROI containing markers, calculated centers for object clusters, and a landscape distance map with basins or local minimum. That's a mouthful. So <laughs> three of them you need, right? But one of them, you really don't need to do watershed transformation. I can tell that the people are thinking because it's taking longer. Yeah, this is a, <laughs> the, uh, the slider bars are going yeah, yeah. Uh, all over the About place. About a halfway. So. I'm going to give you a few more seconds to think. So you have to count what you need, right? Yeah. See what's not required. Okay. So that's about majority of the audience, I think, ready to yes. vote it. So I'm going to end the polling and share the results. Let's see. OK. Oh, OK. So what's not required? A landscape distance map with the basins or local minimum is not required was the collective answer. That actually is not correct. Um, there is one of these that is not required for watershed, seg uh, watershed transformations. And I'm gonna show you a picture to illustrate exactly why that's the case. So I was gonna turn that off and I'm gonna give you a look at a picture. All right, so we're gonna look at this picture and it illustrates uh, what the watershed transform is actually doing. So we can assume that this is a data set that is segmented into say foam, which is the gray area, and then the lighter area in this case are our air pockets. In order to do this correctly, what we need to do is to identify separately each of the air pockets um, in the segmented data. So one, we need segmented data. And two, we need a region of interest or multi-ROI that identifies a marker for each of these separate air pockets. Uh, the other thing that we need to do is we need to have a landscape because what's gonna happen is each of these markers, each of these areas where you have a minimum is going to be filled. It's kind of why they call it the watershed because just envision filling it with water until it fills to the top, to the edge of each of these air pockets. Then it'll look like this. We'll end up with separated objects. We don't nearly need to know, we don't need to know where their centers are. That is not required, and that was the correct answer in the last poll. Um, what is also required is that you're careful when you do this. So let's say, for example, that you inadvertently forgot to assign a marker for one of these air pockets. Then what's going to happen is 
one of these fills on the other side, then it will become merged with an adjoining air pocket. So we want to pay attention to how we create markers. All right, so then with that, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna show you exactly how to do this in Dragonfly. So we have our segmented data, we now need our markers and we need a landscape. So uh, the way that I'm going to assign markers is to create a distance map using the foam data. It's gonna take about 16 seconds here. All right, well, while that's processing, why don't we go ahead and we got a couple sure. of questions come in. We'll get one of them out here from, uh, from Carlos. Um, so he's asking uh, specifically, does Dragonfly have any limitations in terms of the size of the file that you can use? He uh, says a huge CT scan file that is hard to manage in other software. I think the largest one I've worked on is close to 40 gigabytes and it takes some patience. But uh, Mike, this is probably something best fitting for you. Uh, the largest one I've worked on is 140 gigabytes. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> and uh, that, was, that was loading the whole thing into memory. Um, if you want to load just a fraction of the file, that's something Dragonfly lets you do. So if you have a big file and you just say, well, let me just load this, this zone, this uh, small subregion, uh, you can do that at import time. Uh, but if you have enough co uh, RAM on your computer, you can load as big a file as you want. So there's no, there's no limits there. The limit is more than the amount of RAM you actually have, correct? Right. So That's sixty-four, right. right? Sixty-four gig would give a sixty gigs of data. Be okay. All right. Thank you. It sounds like the limit comes from your budget. It's uh, <laughs> for your how computer. It, how much of a computer yes. you have? Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Okay. Now let's have a look at this distance map. And I'm gonna turn off our labels here. So what we end up with is now another grayscale uh, data set where dark voxels are those that are close together foam voxels, where the light ones are those where there's a large distance between adjacent foam voxels. And we're gonna use this to uh, create our markers. How do we do that? So we can define the range for our, from our distance map foam, you can again use an Otsu, why not? Um, and then what we need to do is we need to kind of dive through here and make sure that each of the air pockets has a marker. So here's one on the bottom left over here that doesn't have a marker. So I can adjust this range till I see it pick it up and uh, go through and make sure that we get one up. Oh, now we've got a little marker there. We also wanna pay attention to um, locations where markers may run into each other. So for example, here, we have a single marker perhaps for two, uh, two distinct air pockets. We need to fix that. Um, so I'm gonna add this to new, I'm gonna turn this off, and I'm gonna show you how you would get rid of that, that problem with a connected marker. So in this case, we're gonna paint it simply away. I'm gonna say multi-slice. And if I'm, when I'm in this painting mode and I click shift, then I can just erase the connection between those markers and away they go. So now they are two distinct markers. And this at currently has one single region of interest containing all of the markers. And what we need to do is we need them to be distinct. So we're gonna create a multi-ROI. Now what you'll see is that each of your markers are a different color. They're each uh, separated. Okay, so we've got our multi-ROI. We have our segmented data. Now we need a landscape. So let's turn this off and ask the question, how about if we just used this as our landscape? So I'll just find a good region here. I guess it shouldn't matter. We're gonna draw a map across here. And we're gonna look at a plot of the intensities um, for this distance map. Okay, so what we see is here's an air pocket that's here and it has a high value that goes uh, to a, a zero level. And then in the next air pocket, we have another peak. So this is actually the inverse of what we want. We want local minima, we don't want peaks. So that's really easy to address in Dragonfly. So we can right click on our distance map 
and we can simply invert it and say apply. Okay, close. And now we have this distance map. So I'll turn off uh, this one and we'll look at the same area here. And instead of the distance map, we want the inverted one. And now what we see are local minima and a landscape that we can use for our watershed function. Okay, so now what do we do next? So I'm gonna turn off these rulers and we're gonna get started. There's our multi-ROI. So if you right click on the multi-ROI, you'll see watershed transform and it asks you for your landscape. Well, we just calculated that. That's the inverse of the distance map. And then addish additionally, we need a mask. So this is basically gonna say, as you're filling it up, what defines the edge of each of those? And of course, those are our air pockets. And we'll say, okay. I don't remember how long this will take, a few seconds. We might have time for a question. Sure, sure. So we did have a question is, you know, when or how, you know, what prompted machine learning, deep learning to become a pretty most, really the most common method now for, you know, image processing? Um, you know, is it, is it the computers? Is it the, you know, has the software come along that far that it's a combination of both? Yes. <laughs> so uh, the first uh, neural networks were used in the, say, the 60s, but it really was in the 80s when there were some, uh, some groundbreaking changes and then also the growth of the computing power. So I, I'm not a history major, but um, I do know that we would, be, we would not be able to show you what we're showing you now 20 years ago, for sure. All right. And then... Um... I think we had you had mentioned this earlier is kind of the better that you paint, and this was back on your original for the deep learning, the better you paint and create that model, the faster, the better the machine learning gets, correct? That is correct, yes. Okay. And uh, it, the more accurate your input data, the basically that's more accurate uh, information that you're feeding to the neural network to learn how to assign voxels. So that's for sure. Okay. All right, so here are our, here's our watershed transformed uh, data um, where the blue pockets were and our foam. And we see that these are all quite well separated. Well, we might've had one connection right here that we might not have gotten rid of, but, but basically we now have our objects or our air pockets that are separated and we can start to do some quantitative analyses. So, what are some of the things that we might want to do or, or to calculate for this data set? Well, Dragonfly is quite useful in that it gives you a number of these uh, automagically, I would say. So for example, if we open up the analysis of our, our multi-ROI and we click this button here, then we see a number of statistical properties that we could calculate for, for these data. So for example, I mean, obviously we might be concerned with what's the volume or surface area. We might want to know what are our, what is its location in Z throughout this tomogram? We might be interested in that. We might want to know the number of voxels for each of them. So I'll just do these two to kind of give you an example. So uh, now we have the calculated volume for each of these and we see that they're color coded um, with a blue, green, yellow LUT. And we can also look at a histogram plot that is similarly color-coded. I'll turn off our foam. Uh, similarly color-coded. So those air pockets that have large volumes are yellow, and those that have smaller volumes are on the purple, and the blue and green are those things in between. So you get two visual cues here to analyze those. If we look at the location in Z, for example, better to look at this guy right here. This is, uh, this is Z um, top to bottom. So those that are, uh, and with higher values in Z are yellow, basically those on this side and those are smaller are purple on this side and the others all in between. So that's uh, some information that you can easily calculate with, uh, with Dragonfly for these types of things. 
We could also do some analysis of the foam. So if you go back to those other workshops, you can see how uh, I calculated uh, some, uh, or analyzed the thickness of the foam and the distribution of that throughout. So that's something you might wanna look at. Now, when things are globular, then some of these uh, statistical properties may or may not have uh, significant meaning. So what I wanna do is to show you a different data set where we might look at something like the aspect ratio. And aspect ratio is the ratio of the length to the width. And so you imagine globular things probably have an even distribution there of those, or pretty, pretty narrow. And then the, uh, those that are, say, fibers would have a completely different looking distribution. So they would have very small values uh, for their aspect ratio. Just take a couple of seconds to load here. All right. Oh, doesn't show it here. Let's see. There they are. Okay, so this is uh, a group of organic fibers that I collected on the CT Lab HX instrument. And what's interesting about these fibers is that in the center of some of them, there are these uh, holes. And uh, that's sort of the reason why I wanted to show you this is how we might uh, calculate some values for these and then how might these little holes influence our uh, watershed transformation. So remember we needed segmented data. I already have that. We have uh, an inverse um, distance map so this is our landscape. And then we have our uh, rather seeds that were used from the distance map using uh, the air data. And one of the things that I wanted you to see is that these can look quite strange and they can be more complicated to clean up. And the consequence of doing a watershed transformation with this type of issue, see there's, they're almost like little donuts over here, is that Sometimes when you do the watershed transformation, this may be this one single fiber may be broken into separate pieces. And if we calculate the aspect ratio, the value of a fiber will be completely different, say, than these extra bits. Um, so how might we fix this type of problem and put these things back together again? So that's very easy to do. We can just go to the analysis window here and we get our list of our fibers. So we have a total of 70 fibers in uh, this multi-ROI. I can click on the upper left-hand button and I see one right there in my foreground. I can click each of the extra pieces and I can say, merge them together. You can do this uh, clicking and selecting and merging from any of the windows. You don't have to use the 3D volume. You can do that uh, directly from, from any of the others as well. So once you have them all put back together, then we can calculate some things, volume, and we're gonna look at aspect ratio. So I know there is one more fiber that's split into little pieces, and I left it that way on purpose. Um, and then we can say, look at phi or theta to look at the orientations. Say, okay. All right, so here we can look at the, the volume. For example, again, we have a, a plot of that as well uh, that we can look at and we'll need some gradient here. Um, we see they're very consistent, those with fairly consistent across all the fibers. Those that are darker are larger volume than others. If we look at the aspect ratio, we see that consistently most of these data all have an aspect ratio that's quite uh, small, has a small value, but there's one up here that's greater than 0.4, and that can help you find these disconnected portions of, of a fiber. So, for example, uh, we could uh, go back to our here, and we could click on this guy, and if we have it synchronized, then we could easily find out where it is, and, and here we could, again, put it back together again. 
here. Oh, why doesn't that? It's merge back together. So you can see that sometimes calculating some statistical properties, uh, for example, aspect ratio for these fibers, that can help you find some of your outliers or uh, problem areas in your watershed transformed file. Okay, so uh, with that, I think we'll go back and we'll wrap things up here. All right, to do that, I need to go back to this other window. All right. So what I wanna do now is to wrap up and the things that we covered in this particular workshop was how to do deep learning segmentation, how to separate objects. And then finally, we looked at how to apply some quantitative analyses to separated objects. And with that, it looks like we have some time for a Q and A. Yeah, we do have time for a, a quick Q&A. Um, I'll start off the questions. Um, the first question I have was, so in the beginning, you created a smaller region to do your um, segmentation and so on. Did you do that simply for the time here? Or would you actually recommend somebody actually do the full image and go image to image? I do actually both whenever I, if I'm dealing with a, say a customer data set, for example, I'll use the segmentation wizard to bootstrap myself to a good machine learning run or deep learning run from which I'll mark several slices of the data set, fully paint those and then run a more in-depth deep learning run. But because of the constraints of, you know, the time we have today, then you got the shortened version. Sure, sure. Okay. All right. Um, so it appears we don't have any additional questions. I did want to point out that uh, I put links to the registration for our October event and a, the quick referenced um, for uh, PDFs that we've been putting out before each of these. So, um, so as I said earlier, a recording of the workshop will be available tomorrow and an email will go out to all the registrants with instructions on how to view the recorded presentation. Links to the resources uh, mentioned in today's chat will also be shared on the landing page. Um, now I wanna point out that you'll also be receiving a second email where you can vote for a topic that you'd like to see us cover again in November, our viewer's choice. All right, and we'll be hosting our next webinar focusing on 4D and in situ applications on Wednesday, October the 13th at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Look forward to seeing you all then. And thank you for joining us. And we'll talk to you again in October. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you Thanks, so Mike. much, Mike. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.